Welcome to the Brownback Seminar Series, jointly hosted by Delta Science Program, Ecosystem Restoration Program, and SWAMP. Today we have Dr. Smith and Dr. Swaggery. Uh, they're going to present the Delta, uh, California's Delta and the uh, back in history about 150, 160 years, and which is a, a, a product of the uh, Delta narrative. Delta Narratives Project, which is supported by Delta Protection Commission, which designed to do all these different things. And if you are interested and you want to figure out more about the project, please visit the website. Today we have Dr. As I said, Dr. Smith and Dr. Swagdi, and the was nice enough to uh, send this picture of. So, uh, without saying much, both of them are from the uh, University of the Pacific, and the, uh, uh, they are both historian and in the uh, uh, reside in the Department of History. Dr. Smith is from California, graduated from the UC Berkeley, and got the uh, PhD in Harvard University. Has been a faculty member for about ten years, and uh, at the University of Chicago, and moved back to California and been there since. Dr. Swaggery is from New Mexico, with a uh, New Mexico connection there, um, uh, graduate of Colorado College and the UC Santa Barbara, where, where he got the PhD, and the, uh, been at the University of Pacific since 2001, if I'm getting every information correctly. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to Turn the podium over to Dr. Swaggery. Okay, thank, you thank you very you. much. Well, a privilege to be with you today. I understand there are a number of scientists in the audience and uh, others who are probably far more knowledgeable than we are about many aspects of the Delta, but Ruben and I have have had a, uh, an adventure of learning, if you will, since we were uh, commissioned to do the trade, transportation, and communication sections of the Delta Narratives Project. So today we're going to share with you some of our conclusions, some of our evidence uh, leading to those conclusions, but it's going to have to be pretty fast, and uh, some of you may be disappointed in the the level of, of depth, but uh, in, a, in an hour, this is uh, what we can do. Uh, I will start, and then Ruben will take over about halfway through. Our themes are these. We're looking at defining the Delta first, very briefly, population before and after the gold rush. The Delta is an obstacle between coast and interior, a major theme. Emergence of Sacramento and Stockton as supply points for the mines and the link with the Bay Area. And then Stockton and Sacramento as manufacturing towns. We're going to focus more on Stockton than Sacramento there. The Delta is a transportation corridor. This is where Reuben takes over. The Delta is catalyst for mechanical and technological innovation, <coughs> producer of ag products, and finally destination for recreation and tourism. That's a lot to do in a short brown bag session, but we'll at least introduce you to some of our themes and be happy to talk with you after about uh, these in more depth. If you have time, we do. Defining the Delta. <clears throat> this is the official Delta Protection Commission map that we started with as our organic uh, geographic uh, starting point. And Ruben and I uh, ventured a bit afar from it, uh, especially to the east, uh, to include uh, Lodi, Lockford, etc., cetera, uh, due to the road systems, the transportation corridors. But pretty much we agreed with the western boundaries, southern boundaries, et cetera. This is the official proposed national heritage area that Senator Feinstein has introduced into the Senate, and uh, the status of which is uh, really unknown at this point. It hasn't gone through committee yet. It would be the third time it's been introduced. That would be through the National Park Service uh, as California's first national heritage area. 
Of course, we need to mention the native tribes of the Delta. That is always important uh, and give them uh, credit for successfully adapting to the Delta's uh, ecosystems. Uh, their numbers weren't huge, but they certainly were present well into the gold rush period. And uh, uh, unfortunately for them and, and for California generally, they, they pretty much were wiped out in the Delta region and forced to amalgamate with other groups or uh, suffer uh, near enslavement uh, or servitude uh, during the 1850s. But these are the tribes that were uh, interested in. I teach Native American history and history of California, so I can get into a lot more depth on this, but we'll need to move on. This is a really interesting um, painting that uh, Robert Benedetti introduced us to as part of the Delta Protection Commission project. Uh, Laura Cunningham has done this conjectural sketch, and it's based in part upon the actual uh, sketch in 1850 of Hawk Farm, the native village near Hawk Farm, uh, owned by John Sutter. You can see the conical uh, above-ground housing that's actually semi-underground as well. And then the infamous Thule reed boat, the delta being defined as a dominant uh, vegetative cover type being a Thule. Delta is an obstacle. The map on the right isn't real clear, but it's from an 1846 map that shows just a few little places in California. Not much population, but more than in the south. The Spaniards were interested in reconnoitering and perhaps even building a mission in the Delta country, but it didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen, it was just too wet. It was always deemed an obstacle, both for boats and for horses. And who wanted to walk overland? into the interior of California, as dangerous as it was, or at least as dangerous as it was perceived to be by the Spaniards. And so they gave up on building in the Delta, and their last mission, as you know, was in Sonoma. It, that, it, that was to be originally a mission in the Delta. And by 1823, in the Mexican period, it was completed uh, far to the north uh, in Sonoma. There wasn't much population left by the 1830s anyway. Uh, by the time the Spaniards had built their last mission, disease had already run its toll through much of California. From the estimated 310,000 at contact in 1769, by the 1830s, as wave after wave of European crowd diseases, especially uh, uh, smallpox, mumps, measles, in addition malaria in 1833, a uh, 50% mortality rate is what Sherburn Cook uh, uh, predicted in his calculations, and that has stood since 1976 is pretty much the figure that most demographers work with. By 1855, uh, well, by the time of the gold rush, only 100,000. By 1855, 50,000, and by 1880, which is on there, 20,000 in all of California. What about? Non-native people, well, as you know, the world rushed in. Uh, 1849, 100,000 folks alone uh, come into California, most of the male. The, the sex ratio very imbalanced, 10 to 1, men to women. 1850, 150,000, still imbalanced, 6 to 1, men to women. And uh, uh, 1852, uh, I say 6 to 1, that should be for the 1852 census, the state census, where we have a little over a quarter million people. And then by 1860, 370, uh, 380, uh, 1870, 560,000, and by 1880, um, near 865. Okay, so California really uh, came into statehood uh, as unique in American history in terms of a population explosion. The Delta has not been studied academically as much as it should have been. Um, but we do give credit, all of us who worked on this project, to John Thompson, who wrote a dissertation at Stanford in 1957. It hasn't been published. It's used over and over again. Uh, the maps are rather crude. It was typed physically on a, a manual or a typewriter, so it's never been digitized as far as I know. But uh, we did use it, and we have some of the maps from that, especially some of his data is also very good, especially on reclamation and crops. An important consideration here is the settlement of the Delta in, in the context of how people acquired land. And we could go into this in great depth. This could be a seminar in itself. But we've, let me just mention a few ways that it happened. First of all, 
one could get a Mexican land grant, and quite a few people did. You could purchase from the Californios themselves, that is the Mexican Californios who had been here for, in many cases, three or four generations. They had the land grants. They were willing, in many cases, to break them up and sell off parcels of them. And that's another method. You could squat or preempt on these lands, and a lot of people did that. Uh, we call them uh, rim landers and back trailers into the Delta, two different kinds that have been studied uh, as people who were gold rush bound, Sierra bound, and then came back toward San Francisco settling in the Delta on the way uh, back to the coast. You could acquire federal or state land by uh, several important land legislative acts, uh, the most important being the 1850 Swamp and Overflow uh, Lands Act, which uh, in many cases uh, every major farmer around Stockton uh, access this to get uh, at least 40 and in some cases uh, 80 or up to 160 acres. Uh, the 1858 California Lands Act extended the Swamp Lands Act for, uh, over state lands, and that helped too. Uh, very easy to acquire, very little money. And then the Homestead Act of 1862, that's uh, the best known of these three. These are just some of the land grants that are on the periphery or within the Delta, uh, acquired uh, by 1850, uh, the well-known uh, lands of John Sutter and Charles Weber as well as John Marsh down by Mount Diablo, and the lesser known Robert Simple and William Wolf School lands, uh, and then the one to the south as well, the Higuera and the Feliz lands. This is the total acreage claimed under the Swamp Lands Act um, as of 1906, and you can see California down there at over two million acres, far from the original intent uh, to mainly make this act apply to the wetlands of the east, but it was extended in 1850 from the 1849 Arkansas Act uh, to include all states. So California came in with a little over two million acres, much of it on the Delta. The development of Sacramento and, and Stockton um, uh, was, is a pretty phenomenal story in itself in terms of rapidity of, of urbanization not without many problems, the, the largest of which was flooding, of course. But these eyewitness sketches by this man, George Baker, are really telling, I think, of how Sacramento developed so quickly and how the technology and the landscape changed so quickly. In a six-year period, from trees and sailboats um, almost dominating the waterfront there to almost no trees, uh, some brick buildings, and steamboats by 1855. After many floods, this is the depiction of the great inundation of 1850, and the worst flood would come in 1862, the worst flood in the state's history. In fact, the capital had to be moved to San Francisco uh, because of the flood, and then back here. Sacramento in 1870. Notice the uh, bridge open here. This is the first bridge across the Sacramento River. Very important development for the railroad and for horses, wagons, and people to get across. Stockton, the first lithograph that we have of Stockton showing Captain Weber's store right here, as well as all these flour sacks that Stockton already, a grain and hay center for the gold rush, the southern mines in particular. And it became, of course, a major steamboat uh, town, as did Sacramento. They paralleled, really. We argue in our essay that it's a triangular relationship, Sad the Bay Area of Sacramento, Stockton, even though the traffic between Stockton and Sacramento was not a parallel one. That is, it wasn't equal to the commerce between, of course, San Francisco, Sacramento, and San Francisco, Stockton. But it is a triangular relationship, and the wagon roads um, uh, provide that, uh, that link, and later the railroads. Stockton was the supplier to the mines by way of freight wagons. Its early uh, manufacturing really centered on wheels uh, and carriages and wagons like this freighter here. This is one of the earliest carriage factories in 1852, and by 1865, the Stockton Wheel Works was manufacturing all kinds of wagons and tank tankers, uh, et cetera, and this was one of their largest wheeled trammels for logging by 1880. Stockton in 1870, um, bird's eye view, uh, similar to the one we saw of Sacramento. And Stockton is a grain and, and uh, flower shipping port with a Sperry 
mills, which became General Mills later, uh, in the background, some of those buildings still standing. Note the number of sacks on, the, on this uh, steamboat here and all the activity in that photograph. Ethnic communities are uh, huge in Delta history, and uh, Jennifer Helzer, who wrote the essay for the Delta Narratives Project, uh, is probably going to speak with you at some point, so we're not going to go into that in much depth. We're just going to mention with one slide each the Chinese, the Portuguese, the Italians, the Japanese, and Filipinos, and then Hispanics. Chinatowns on the Delta, still an attractive draw for tourism uh, and important historically. Uh, you see the map here from Bitter Melon. We don't know where this is, but it's very typical of the earliest Chinatowns. They were, they were stilted because Chinese couldn't own land. They could only lease it from non-Chinese. And they actually lived on houseboats more than they lived even in these apartments or houses that were built out on, on piers in the earliest days. This was the, the most practical, safest, and cheapest way to, to live while building the levees of the Delta and working uh, on the railroad as well, as you know. The Central Pacific was built in large measure by Chinese and Irish uh, labor. The Portuguese came especially to Sacramento, but also throughout the west part of the, uh, or the uh, west of the river, settled uh, in the pocket, Garcia Bend, et cetera. This is the original Manuel de Rosa Gracia, was his original name, changed it to Garcia, and uh, married Lenora Silvera, and uh, there they are in 1879. And the interesting thing to us about this is the uh, ribbon or long lot pattern that developed in the pocket, giving all of the Portuguese who settled uh, in this area uh, near equal access to the river. And you still see some of that, although it's been gridded in a different way in modern times. But in 1946, this was the Luis or Lewis Ranch right here that still reflected this pattern here and this pattern here. The Italians uh, settled, uh, Martinez uh, was a, a large settlement of, of Italians as well, Collinsville. Uh, Dr. Benedetti insisted that we include uh, his people, the Italian Americans, in this project. And so we did, finding lots of fishermen in particular in the Collinsville area. And this is the home that both Joe and Dominic uh, uh, DiMaggio uh, grew up in. This is uh, one of the uh, hallmarks of uh, Martinez. Japanese, no specific place or time here, but they became important uh, truck farmers and uh, were very uh, early on important in the asparagus industry, uh, especially. Uh, but all, anything, any of the green crops that we think of on the Delta, the Japanese became involved, and some of them became major owners. We think of George Shima and the potato king of uh, the Stockton area, but there were many, many, many others. And Filipinos, even though they mainly lived in Stockton, they worked the Delta by day, and they became the great grass cutters uh, with these very specialized knives that uh, we found at the Rio Vista Museum. Oh. And then finally, uh, Mexican labor. Um, sure, there were many Mexicanos, Californios, who stayed on the Delta or its periphery after American takeover and statehood in 1850, but most blended into the ranches, the uh, the, the uh, Anglo-controlled by by and large land system after that, and it really wasn't until after World War One that we see a large influx influx of Mexican immigrants coming into participate uh, as migrant workers in the first of several Bracero programs. We think of the more famous Bracero program of 1942 to 64, but there was one before that from 24 to 30, whereby 58,000 uh, Mexicans on average per year were brought in. And it's estimated 4.5 million actually participated in the more, more well-known Bracero program of World War II and beyond. And now Reuben will take over. Thank you, Bill. The uh, important point that we want to keep in mind here is that um, there was a very close interrelationship of the development of technology 
and the development of the kinds of crops that were grown on the delta. And uh, we want to focus at the moment on changes in transportation technology. That is to say, I'm not going to say anything about the age of sail, we don't have the time, but the age of steam, and then uh, particularly the importance of the internal combustion engine. But by that I mean the gasoline and later the diesel engine in revolutionizing transportation. The first thing we always think about is the iconic steamboat. And these are examples of side wheeler steamboats, uh, the kind that uh, we kind of think about not only for the, our delta here, but particularly the Mississippi River and so on. And one uh, important uh, uh, steam, uh, 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 what am I trying to say? Uh, uh, anyway, uh, a famous kind of uh, development here was that uh, in 1861, the side wheel steamer set a record from Sacramento to San Francisco in five hours, 19 minutes, a record that still stands. And over here, this is part of the California Steam Navigation Company, which didn't quite have a monopoly on steamboating the Delta, but certainly had a very strong and principal presence. But side wheel steamboats tend to take a little more draft. And so eventually toward the 19th century and certainly into the 20th century, um, stern wheelers became the most important steamboats on the Sacramento River and the Delta in general. But very soon, uh, certainly beginning in the early part of the 20th century, there had been enough development agri in agriculture to attract railroad um, a building, and uh, the Sacramento Southern Railroad Road was a subsidiary of the Southern Pacific Railroad. And as you see, it built starting in 1906 from Sacramento uh, down to Freeport and eventually to through Walnut Grove to Isleton. The, um, the dream of every railroad economist is that the railroad will be used year-round. And so here, what the Southern Pacific, actually Sacramento Southern, is very proud to point out that from Walnut Grove, you can ship celery from November to February, asparagus from February to May, fruit from May through September, and seeds from September through November with a picture of the steam railroad, uh, steam engine hauling asparagus cars. But on the west side of the Delta, the Sacramento Northern Railway, an electric railway, which eventually ran from Oakland through Sacramento to Chico, 183 miles of electrified railway, built down the west side of the Delta. And um, here you see a map uh, in which the, uh, let's see if I can operate this. Uh, here is the main line of the Sacramento Northern Electric Way coming from Oakland through up to Sacramento and on to Chico. But they built this branch line down the west side or the Holland branch of the Delta and down to, uh, get rid of this here, down to a, uh, an ending which was called Oxford they never built to Rio Vista, which was their aim, but they did build, whoops, I'm going the wrong way here. What's the matter? Use the pointer, not the mouse. Okay. I seem to be stuck. Just forget this mouse. It's going to just cause. There we go. Okay, let me go back. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, notice that there's a little branch out to. Um, um, <laughs> I was block on. Uh, uh, below Freeport.
Help me out, Clarksburg. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, to the sugar beet factory out there, um, the whole Sacramento Northern line is a very impressive electric line. Okay. The Western Pacific Railroad is the last railroad of the transcontinental railroads to be built. It, uh, its line, which now is part of the Union Pacific line, runs along just east of Interstate 5 between Stockton and Sacramento, built uh, to Salt Lake City and eventually eastward. But it uh, had junctions uh, into uh, the Delta along term uh, to terminus along the uh, Highway 12 from just around Thornton. Uh, here is an example of one of the passenger trains, electric passenger trains, going over the Tower Bridge. Uh, the three lines you see over there on the right are the Western Pacific, the Southern Pacific, and the Central California traction between Stockton and Sacramento. The rail lines left over of the California traction still are uh, accessible between Elk Grove and Sacramento, and they're are sometimes suggestions of the uh, ability to uh, maybe use them in the future. But the important development technologically was the internal combustion engine, as we say. Both of these kinds, the Caterpillar tractor and the uh, Samson truck company, are both Stockton-based uh, uh, industries. And the tractor was used, could be used, not just for plowing, but actually for towing wagon trains. The inboard motor that we think of uh, as uh, a principal uh, gasoline motor, uh, here is being on the left-hand side, you see uh, three men riding uh, an inboard motor down into a boat. A boat of a kind, for example, you see on the right-hand side there, uh, the George Shima, uh, and these were built, again, in Stockton. But in addition to inboard motors was the development of the outboard motor, and this made available the possibility of sport fishing and transportation of small boats. There's a story that Ole Evenrude designed the outboard motor, invented it, in order to be able to cross the lake to get ice cream for his fiancée so that he wouldn't have to row. But roads were a problem because the Delta soil, as we all know, is a very porous and very damp soil, and it raised all kinds of problems uh, for any kind of transportation. On the right-hand side, that cross-hatching that you see are the wetlands, uh, and notice how far east uh, the wetlands go, uh, particularly between Stockton and Sacramento. Uh, here is an example of the delta soil types. Uh, porous and spongy and damp are what you want to think about, and you see the tractor pulling the truck out of the way, and up there on the upper right-hand side, your typical delta levee roads today, the road on the top of the levee and often the land below the water level. So after the beginning of highway construction, including federal funded highway construction, we have three main routes through the Delta. The east-west route from west of Suisun coming through Rio Vista and going out over on the right-hand side, uh, I, uh, past Lodi and into the uh, Mother Lode country, uh, the so-called uh, Highway 12. From north to south, we have Highway 160 coming down the so-called River Road down to Antioch. And on the lower left-hand side, coming from uh, west of Martinez uh, through Antioch and across the Delta through Holt and into Stockton and again on toward the mother Road, Highway 4. That meant with highways that bridges were very necessary to be able to cross as well as ferries, which had preceded the bridges, but uh, the bridges had to be movable. And so there was a pivot-type bridge, the so-called strauss bascule bridges at Paintersville, Walnut Grove, and so on, all built to the same plan by the strauss bascule Bridge Company of Chicago. 
And finally, lift bridges, our familiar tower bridge with our familiar steamboat or the Rio Vista lift bridge. And as we had talked about, the uh, highway transport from east to west through Rio Vista on Highway 12 or north-south on Highway 160 through Rio Vista, Rio Vista became a capital, more or less, or a center hub anyway, uh, for bus transportation. Here's a 1920s bus, and the bus ran from the Sacramento Northern Junction at Rio Vista Junction, as it's called now, which is now a, an electric railway museum, west of Rio Vista, uh, out to uh, Isleton and actually into San Francisco as well. But the early innovations in uh, 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 technical uh, development, uh, in the upper right-hand uh, corner there, you see an iron tule shoe, in other words, a horseshoe with a greater shoe around it. That was brought, the design was brought by the Chinese, uh, where in China they were made of bamboo here in iron. And the Fresno scraper, which is a way of leveling, uh, one person can operate it and uh, with either one animal or several animals. And thinking of hand labor and horse teams, Holt was interested in this because four women are operating that harvester. But the important point was the application of steam, as we had said before, for steam boats, now to land transportation. Notice the width of the wheels on the steam tractor to the left, but on the steam tractor to the right, you have three wheels on each side, each six feet wide, in order that they not sink into the soil. And here are four steam tractors hauling actually a dredge across the land to get from one waterway to another. And of course, steam was applied to the pumps to be able to move the water around. Now, the delta soil, as you know from the previous lecture by Phil Garone, uh, being porous and being built by hand labor was not a very uh, practical levy at all because it was too porous, the water went in and out. So the attempt was to be able to move more dirt faster than could be done by hand, but also to be able to use the bottom uh, soil from the channel which was much uh, thicker and could be compacted more easily. So steam shovels were tried, but as you see, that boom, both booms, are really rather short and there isn't much uh, of a reach. And so the clamshell steam dredge was developed. You see the clamshell over there on the left-hand side, which could hold up to six yards uh, at one bite from the bottom land which was very solid and much thicker than peatland. And you also see the very long boom, which a steam shovel couldn't have, in order to be able to reach not only the top of the levee, but across the levee. When electricity came to the delta, of course, it was much easier to operate electric pumps than it was steam pumps. And so electricity made a big difference in pumping, not just in lighting houses. And finally, the Holt brothers developed the Caterpillar tractor in Stockton. These are early Caterpillars. There's a story uh, told that uh, Holt was showing off one of these new inventions to somebody and asked, what do you think about it? And this person said, well, it looks like a Caterpillar to me. And Holt said, that's it. That's what we'll call it. And here are more recent equipment. Uh, not only the kind of track-laying tractor on the left, this happens to be a cleat track, but on the right, another person, particularly in the Stockton area, who's often not remembered because the Holt brothers are so famous, was Robert Letourneau. And Letourneau developed very large land-moving and leveling equipment, uh, first towed behind a Caterpillar tractor, but then with its own power, as the picture you see in the right-hand side, beginning in the 1930s and 40s in this huge uh, land uh, uh, movement uh, equipment, which we now know all over the world. Uh, one of their uh, developments was what was called a turnipole. These are used in highway and other construction. But another very important innovation was the development of the refrigerated rail car, 
We haven't got time to talk about uh, icing and, uh, and uh, what happened, but here you see basically starting in uh, after 1906, produce could be shipped in iced refrigerator cars and in the later 1930s mechanical refrigerator cars, and that meant then that instead of moving produce in w horses and wagons and later on in small trucks, to Delta water landings, they would be moved to these railroad terminals and loaded in refrigerated trucks. So trucks then became important. Not only the early flatbed trucks, but eventually the big refrigerator trucks. And that would mean then that uh, there would be a change in uh, what happened in Delta uh, preservation. But here very briefly, uh, briefly we go from uh, the early uh, crops of hay and grain, that is to say animals and, and human food, to field crops. And particularly by the late 19th and early 20th century, the cross hatches or the darkness you see uh, in, these, uh, in this map show where these crops were uh, grown. Sugar bees became very important as candy and particularly chocolate candy production uh, outstripped uh, for sugar the uh, supply from cane sugar. And so sugar beets were introduced and uh, sugar beet ha uh, harvesting machinery had to be developed. Potatoes became an important crop. That particular landing happens to be a Chinese landing. Asparagus was grown and you see all over the delta and you also see why asparagus spears are more or less the same length because their bottoms get cut off by a knife. Other important field crops, though, uh, could include celery. And in this case, in the, uh, about carrots, we forget sometimes that the Delta was an important nursery area. This is Mr. and Mrs. Bogle harvesting carrot seeds. The truck crops and orchards, particularly pear orchards, then became important. Uh, again, the latter part of the 19th and in the earlier 20th century and canning developed. Canning was a way of preserving. Uh, it developed through the 19th century from very dangerous, poisonous canning in the earlier part of the 19th century to dependable canning. Also, can lids became the width of the cylinder of the can rather than having only a very small opening with a stopper. So instead of having mushy foods put in the earlier cans, whole chunks such as pear chunks or meat chunks could go into the canning. On the west side of the delta, this Dutch theme was developed very strongly, and you can see the wooden shoes and the Dutch windmills and that sort of thing from the so-called Holland Tract or the New Netherlands. Canneries, as I said, began growing, and one of the things we sometimes forget about was the importance of salmon cannery canning, not just fruits and vegetables. Here is a salmon cannery. So when you see the growth then of the total fruit pack uh, from 1900, uh, 2.8 million, now this includes all of California, so this includes Imperial Valley, Santa Clara, and so on, but in just 40 years to almost 29 million uh, cases, that's a lot. But as refrigeration came to be more important uh, and canning, uh, began uh, uh, being much more developed in the heavy population uh, centers, the canning and canneries in the Delta moved out to certain places, as you see, it's San Leandro, San Jose, Stockton, and so on. And then the canneries in the Delta uh, fell into disrepair. The other area uh, that is very important to remember is particularly with the advent of the outboard motor, but in general, the Delta became a center of recreation and tourism with its many marinas and also its many restaurants. A number of you are familiar with, for example, Giusti's or the Point in Rio Vista. And so, again, with more crops changing in different ways, we have uh, the development, for example, the Bogles went from carrots to wines. The water wars, of course, have come in much more recently. We are very familiar with them, and there you see on the red line is a map of the proposed tunnel. 
And in these particular editorial cartoons, which we need to give a uh, uh, provenance to, are from the Sacramento Bee's uh, editorial cartoonist. And here you have on the left the governor saying, don't worry, we've worked out uh, a legislative solution. And you see the legislative solution there. Or over here, we have an aide to the governor at the grand opening of the Delta Tunnels, and the aide is saying, it is turned on, sir. That's it, folks. We'd be happy to take questions, comments, uh, whatever. I'm sorry it's a little bit late, but uh, we hope you have a good chance. Do you have a question? Or maybe you're... Microphone. Yeah, thank you for coming and making the presentation. What has happened to, uh, or what was the lifespan of that electric northern railway, and what happened to its right-of-way, the tracks? Are they still in use in some capacity, or are they trails? Okay, the question was, what happened to the Sacramento Northern Railway? The Sacramento Northern Railway began as two separate railroads, the Northern Electric from Chico built down to Sacramento, in the early uh, de first decade of the 20th century, uh, roughly 1906, 7, 8, right along in there. And the southern portion, uh, the Oakland, Antioch, and Eastern, which was built from Oakland up through the Oakland Hills, through a tunnel in the Montclair District down past Santa, uh, St. Mary's College, and, and on eventually to uh, the waterway in West Pittsburgh, uh, where it used a ferry and never got its bridge built for both passenger and freight trains, and then sent them up uh, west of Rio Vista uh, and on up through the, uh, the uh, near the Dixon area and into West Sacramento and uh, uh, into Sacramento and then on to uh, where it joined the Northern Electric. Uh, the right-of-ways of that um, are essentially all gone. In the East Bay, parts of BART, particularly the Pittsburgh uh, Concord uh, area, used those, that right away. And so that was still preserved. Um, the tracks are uh, still in existence uh, on the north side of the uh, uh, littoral, the river area, uh, going up through Rio Vista Junction and on up north to the Jepson Prairie, which is a very interesting place one of the few places in California, particularly in the Delta area or the Valley area, that was never plowed. And that belongs as a right-of-way to the uh, Western Railway Museum, uh, and you can ride on uh, five and a half miles of that if you go out on any weekend for an electric uh, car ride. Uh, then uh, uh, I understand a little bit of some of the right-of-way has been used in Sacramento here for public transportation, but all the rest of the way north is essentially gone. Thank you. One thing Ruben didn't mention is he's a motorman out at the Western Railway Museum, so you may get him driving that electric every other Sunday. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Did you did you find uh, sorry uh, did did you find a lot of information? Uh, the simple answer is no. Uh, although there are some popular books on boating and fish derbies, and certainly uh, chambers of commerce have promoted the marinas, and they've promoted themselves. There's Franco's Delta. Uh, recreation map. There's uh, quite a bit of billboard uh, history uh, that goes with it, advertisements in everything from um, uh, local newspapers to uh, the Byron Times, um, which we used considerably. The Hagen Museum has an almost perfect collection of the Byron Times, and we went through all of those. But no, uh, there isn't a great deal on recreation on the Delta, and it's, it's a topic that needs more work. 
One thing I would add about recreation on the Delta, it's something that could be promoted in a number of ways, but there are some obstacles at the moment. One of them is that the uh, there's no central place where a tourist can go to get information to find out where would the maps be that I could go, uh, what are the historical areas that I can see, what even are a, a, a collection of the history museums and other things that are available in the Delta. And then when you drive down these narrow two-lane roads uh, that are on top of levees, there's almost no place to pull off to be able to uh, to see things. So there's a lot of work that could be done uh, develop, uh, helping develop tourism. Even advertising uh, restaurants and places to eat, uh, some of these places that you saw in our photographs here uh, are not well advertised at any distance at all from them on the Delta. So where do you eat? When um, are you talking about the uh, the break? Question had to do with the island uh, or the, the big break in uh, 1970. Uh, can somebody help me out on a date? East Bay Regional Park. I, I'm not sure about. I was thinking one farther out. Yes, I, I guess. And uh, the decision made not to re, uh, to to leave it uh, as a waterway. I, I can't help you on uh, on some of those levee breaks. I would have hoped that uh, that uh, uh, Phil yeah Phil Garon would have said something about that. Maybe he did in his essay. Well, it's possible. You can go online and look at the Garone essay on reclamation. We're still learning about the Delta. I'm just kind of curious if you know the context of the Delta agricultural systems and the crops being grown there to the surrounding areas and what was happening in the Sacramento Valley or San Joaquin Valley and was the Delta special and significant or was it just part of a greater system of agriculture throughout the valley? That's a really interesting question, and um, I'll, I'll try to answer it. Uh, and I don't mean to sound negative here, because well, there's there's a, a lot of uh, good uh, work that's been done on the Delta. But um, it, it's surprising that uh, UC Davis, for example, has not produced PhDs in ag history that would have produced the books that we need that answer that very question. So from our research, we found that yes, the Delta was promoted as specialty crops and especially specialty truck crops, but the big difference was the uh, promotion of the Delta as being far more productive per acre uh, by the bushel for each of these crops. For example, potatoes, potatoes grown around Stockton, at least to the east, um, almost 20 bushels less per acre than on the delta. And so that was how the delta came to be perceived as land more valuable, land more productive, and land consistently uh, watered in drought or, or uh, wet years. You always had the water. You didn't have to worry about that. And, of course, too much water sometimes. <laughs> famous 1957, uh, the 1957 thesis by Thompson. Uh, do you know anything about the history of how he came to write that and how he picked that as a dissertation topic? I do not. I know it's in geography, and uh, Stanford at the time had a very good geography department. And uh, uh, so uh, he went on to have an academic career, and he participated with uh, Edward Dutra of the famous Rio Vista Dutra family in writing the Thule Breakers, which Holt Atherton Special Collections at the University of the Pacific published as a book in the 1980s. Yeah. And he published a number of articles, including a couple in ag history and California history, but never turned this into a book, a monograph. Um, it's still doable. His data is very good. He has. In his appendix, uh, the maps are not very clear, and you saw some of them on our slideshow. But, for example, he has uh, all these different crops at 1924, then again another map at 1938, uh, again most of them in 1945, and a few of them in 1952. 
including tomatoes, and we didn't even talk about tomatoes. But So if you really are interested in specific crops, he's got tables, charts, maps, and discussion. And it's very specific as to uh, where these crops were introduced and, and grown. Uh, he did very good work uh, here in the archives in Sacramento. Uh, the land records, et cetera. He really, uh, it, it's really uh, a powerful uh, piece of work, and I would really like to see it published. One other specialty crop that has interested me, and we unfortunately had to leave out the information, the slides, has to do with white asparagus. White asparagus, as you know, is grown by piling up the dirt in order that the uh, light does not get to it. It requires an enormous amount of handwork. Uh, it has to be harvested in a special way, and we have a picture of an asparagus cannery uh, in Isleton uh, specializing in that. But uh, white asparagus became uh, a delicacy in this country, but also it had been for quite a long time a delicacy in Germany and other parts of Europe. And so uh, I have said on one or two occasions that I remember as a child growing up and eating white asparagus for salad, but nobody else seems to know if they're younger anything about white asparagus, and I don't even know if you can still get it. In a can only. Yeah. Well, we used to. Yeah. Oh, um, question about the crops. Hasn't that now, uh, like with uh, by the sugar mill and Bogle and all that land, that's all basically vineyards, is it not? Yeah. I mean, instead of the truck crops and the rest of what we had, vegetables, it's now all vineyards. Exactly. I wouldn't, uh, pears are still important too, Bartlett's there you especially. Go. Okay. Uh, one thing we didn't have a slide of, but it, it's interesting to me that uh, Thompson in his dissertation estimates that uh, by 1930, 441,000 acres were under cultivation in the Delta, and today, the state of California estimates 500,000. So it hadn't changed very much. Uh, it's about that's, that half million is really the the figure. If we start flooding islands or creating uh, f flooded tracks within these island districts, as is proposed uh, by the uh, Metropolitan Water District, it was in the of Los Angeles was in the paper this morning, four different islands, Holland, Webb, uh, Bolden, Bolden, and what, what's the other one? Bacon Island, yeah. Then uh, we're going to see a reduction, of course, in that figure of 500,000 and uh, um, be interesting. Okay, thank you so much for coming.